We have at last reached the number one game on our list of the top 10 games in Hillsborough Hops history. And there's no question about this one. They say there's nothing like your first time. And the first time for the Hops came in September of 2014. They've now won three Northwest League championships. But the first one was in 2014. We're joined by Zach Curtis, who later went on to pitch 42 games in the major leagues. But at the time, six years ago, he was the closer for the Hillsborough Hops. And he was on the mound when they uh, won that title in 2014, retiring Chris Carlson on a comebacker to end it. We'll, we'll discuss the game shortly. But uh, first of all, Zach, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Rich? Man, I'm doing great. Joining us from your home uh, in Tennessee. It's been raining there a little bit lately? It's rain. I feel like we haven't gotten a day without rain. I feel like we're in the Pacific Northwest right now. It's, I mean, it's cloudy. It's raining. We get a couple days where it stops, but then it, I mean, it comes right back. So hopefully when this spring season kind of moves forward and gets into the summer, we can get back to normal, humid Tennessee weather. Well, you've had uh, probably more rain than we have here. We had a we had a fantastic month of April. We, uh, um, I mean, it, I could count on one hand the consecutive days we had where it was not raining here in the past month and a half. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we'll get into more about what you're doing now in a little bit. But first of all, a bit of context on uh, what was occurring back in 2014. It was the best of three series. It was a championship game. The series, uh, it was, a, the Hops led one game to none, but the Vancouver Canadians um, were the three-time defending Northwest League champions. And uh, the Hops had taken game one up in Vancouver, uh, two out in the ninth inning, tying run at first base, potential go-ahead run at the plate, an extra base hit, the game's tied, Vancouver has the momentum, and who knows what happens from there. How did you calm your nerves in that situation, or did you calm your nerves? You know, it's funny to think about. It's just one of those things where you kind of have to just take a deep breath. I remember I went back and watched the video from it, and the last strike before he hit that comebacker, I took a long pause, took a deep breath, and just tried to slow everything down a little bit. Um, I mean, everybody's different. Me, I had to slow everything down because I could get very – emotional everybody saw when I played in Hillsboro that I, I pitched with my heart on my sleeve and I'm very enthusiastic when I pitch but that can also steamroll to where you're kind of going out of control where your body you're not in control of your body your mind so by taking that step back just saying make this pitch don't do anything more than you can make this one pitch and you're out of it you're done and so um, definitely had to slow everything down take a deep breath and not even worry about that guy on first base because I've done that before where I worried about the guy on first base and not the hitter, and the hitter got the advantage on me. Well, uh, you ended up retiring Carlson on a comeback. Or do you remember the pitch? Oh, yeah, it was a slider. Down down away. And I, to be honest, when I went back and watched the video, it was a very good pitch, and he, he it was good for him to be able to get the ball on the bat right there because I definitely thought it would have been a strikeout on any other guy. Um, but it came right back to me, not thinking about it. I think I would have done it 10 more times out of 10. I tried to grab that thing barehanded, and it bounced <laughs> off a little bit and uh, just fell right back in my hand, tossed it over to Kevin Crone. I turned right back around and looked for Stryker to run to him. <laughs> and, uh, and then you threw your glove in the air, I think. Uh, you, so you mentioned you tried to barehand it. That ball's hanging in the air just above your head, and you're reaching up to grab it. As that ball's hanging in the air, at any point are you thinking, oh, no. Oh, yeah. I definitely thought when I reached up, you tell me you should have let that go. And when it, I saw where it was coming back down, I understood that it was right in front of me. I just had to catch it. No matter what, just get the ball in your hand and you can get them out. Because I, anybody can throw it faster than people can run. So I was just really trying to concentrate on getting that ball to Kevin. Um, so, But definitely once it bounced off my hand the first time, I thought I was in trouble. But then I realized it was just right there in front of me. That was such an incredible afternoon. It happened to be a Sunday game, and I think the first pitch was thrown at 4 o'clock. It was early September. Fall was in the air. The sun was setting. There was this kind of golden glow in the ballpark as you got that last out, and then particularly as the Hops were celebrating, running the championship flag around uh, the, the field, around the warning track, and showing it to all the fans. What are your memories of that celebration? Shoot. It, I feel like it wasn't six years ago coming up I mean I really I really don't I can vividly remember every part of doing that of gra jumping on striker all the guys coming out there I, I vividly remember Ben Eccles and 
Elvin Soto taking the flag and running it around and just running behind them, just looking at the fans and just kind of in awe of everything like that. That was the first championship I'd ever won uh, on this on on a team like that. So it was definitely surreal and no organization, no fan base, no team, I think, really deserved it more that year than we did because um, that team was a very special team, I thought. Yeah, and that was your first professional season coming out of Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, the Hops went 4-0 and in that postseason, and, and you had uh, you had saved 14 games in the regular season. You saved all four games in that postseason. But again, first year after being drafted in the sixth round by the Arizona Diamondbacks back in 2014, what are your overall memories of your first pro year? I could – it's just amazing. It really is. It was It, it was a – dream come true in a storybook beginning, not an ending, but a beginning to my career. Um, I had, a, I mean, the staff we had with JR and Dougie, I mean, just that whole group, Ben, all of them um, was just great. They're very, they're good to teach guys how to be professionals. I thought I knew before coming in what it meant to be a professional, but definitely JR House groomed me and shaped me into the professional that I became. Um, I think he did that with a lot of guys. He was very tough on guys. Um, but that group of guys molded so well together. Everybody hung out all the time together um, that it was just very easy to kind of be yourself and to relax, whereas you can find some of those teams that are uptight and no one wants to be themselves. They're trying to fit in where they just – we all kind of collaborated and came together. Um, I remember – I do vividly remember very first game of the year at Everett. I left my cleats in my hotel room before the first game and we get to the field and that's the first time I interacted really with house and I had to go into his office and say listen I don't have my cleats I have to get a taxi back to the hotel room and came back and got him and got there and so I then him called me in the eighth inning of one I think it was the first or the second game of the year and I got to strike out the side so it just kind of steamrolled from there it was, it was a lot of fun yeah, it, it was incredible. I, I think you had like one blown save all season long. It was really amazing the job you did. You walk into the manager's clubhouse the day of the first game before the game saying you left your cleats back at the hotel. What did he say? He just looked at me. He said, he said, this isn't a good start. I think he was laughing by saying it. He could tell I was nervous. I was nervous. And it was just one of those jitters. I was trying to rush out, hurry up and get there. And I just le I left him sitting there. I think I had cleaned him and made sure they were cleaned and left him in the bathroom of the hotel room. And he said, you better hurry up and get them. Cause if they don't, you're, you're not here by the time BP starts, you're not playing tonight or you're not going to You're not, you're not going to do anything. So I rushed back, got him, and got back in time. So it, luckily enough, I got in the game. What did you learn from him and Doug Drabeck? You mentioned that, that you learned a lot, but any specifics? I learned how to just, when I say be a professional, being respectful, respecting the game, respecting your teammates, respecting your opponents. So to dress right, act right, conduct yourself in a proper manner so that when you're out and about in the community, people can go back and say, this team is a class act. You don't want anyone to ever have a bad thing to say about the hops or about the Diamondbacks or anything like that. So just kind of teaching you how to respect, the, respect everything around you and how to carry yourself properly. Both of them did a very, very good job in that. Well, a couple of seasons later, you made your major league debut. And, and you've told this, these stories to us before. Um, but tell us again, first of all, how did you find out that you were getting called up to the major leagues? So J.R. House was the, was the uh, manager for the Vice City Rawhide. And it was after a game I didn't pitch. Um, it was probably about two weeks into the season. And... I'm at Whataburger with um, – no, I'm at In-N-Out Burger, excuse me, In-N-Out Burger with my roommate, Blake Perry. And as late as probably about 10.30, 11 o'clock after we got out of the field, and I get a text from Jeff Bajanero saying, hey, get back to the field now. House is furious. You did something wrong. <laughs> he and was a pitching and, coach, Bajanero, right? Yeah, pitching coach. And me and House had a very good relationship, as everybody knows. We still talk to this day. And – but I knew if you got on the house's bad side, he would let you know immediately. He'd let you know how you messed up. And so I didn't understand what I did if I left my locker messy, if I did something just to upset him. So I leave my food on the counter at in and out And I tell Blake, I said, we got to go. And we left. And I get back, and there is 
four, there is no one chair sitting in front of his in desk in his office and there's four chairs in front of me. So him and other three coaches were just sitting there. And I think my throat dropped into my stomach. My heart dropped into my stomach. I was like, holy cow, I messed up bad. And you have no idea. You're racking your brain trying to think, what did I do? Yes. I didn't know. I mean, because in retrospect, looking at it, we were all, I only had 10 games, appearances. I had a five. With the California League, you can give up quite a few runs in a single outing. And I gave up quite a few to the Dodgers at Rancho. And it ballooned my ERA. But at the same time, I think I had 23 strikeouts in 10 innings. So there was good and bad. And for context, uh, you're three rungs below the major leagues. Yeah. Guys don't get called up from advanced A ball very often. No. He's sitting there talking. He said, hey, listen, I know this season so far hasn't been what you expected or what you hold yourself up to. Had a couple bad outings. He said, but what you have done is you've shown your maturity, your perseverance, and your ability just to keep a level head and just keep pushing forward and not let everything kind of fall out of control. He said, with that being said, I want to congratulate you that I'm getting to tell you that you're being promoted. Well, obviously I'm very, very excited. I wonder, first thing I said was what happened at double A who is moving in double A. Cause I had, a, I had some friends there. And um, then I also think in my head, well, this is great. Cause I get to go, see my family because mobile was about four and a half five hours from my house here my wife and son could drive down there and so i'm like awesome thank you i really appreciate that i thank you. i told him i thank all of them for what they've done for me to that point and he said yeah just go ahead and go pack your stuff up and uh i'll email you your itinerary you're gonna fly out in the morning you're gonna meet the team in phoenix and he just said it as casual as possible and at first i didn't catch it and he's smiling at me i said wait and my ham said, hold up, this doesn't add up. And I'll never forget it. It might be one of the more unintelligent things I've ever said, but it just happened because of the moment. I said, there is no Phoenix, Alabama. Because I thought I was going to Mobile. And he said, no, you're not going to Mobile. And I just looked at him for a second. He said, you're going to the big leagues. He said, congratulations, you're going to be a major league baseball player. And I just stared at him. And I just kept saying no. That's no. I just kept saying no. And I'm thinking about it. I can vividly remember myself just saying no. This isn't funny. Don't lie. And I look over. And that's when it really hit me that I looked over and I saw Badge, our pitching coach, was crying. And then House got kind of emotional. And then I lost it. There, that's when that picture popped up of me holding my mouth, shaking JR's hand, and look behind me. And there were still 10, 15 guys in the clubhouse, and they were all standing behind me just going crazy and it was just one of those things that I went out behind the Visalia clubhouse and there was a dumpster and I cried my eyes out I'll, I'll never forget it called my wife back here in Tennessee it was probably two in the morning and I called her and I said hey listen I need you to call the babysitter right now get them over first thing in the morning I need you to buy the first flight you can find out of Nashville or Huntsville and come to Phoenix. I said, cause we did it and called her. Didn't sleep a wink. I went back to my host family's house and did not sleep one bit. I literally stared at the ceiling until my, I left for my flight at uh, 6 a.m. And then flight got delayed actually till 9:30 or so. So I, I didn't show up to Phoenix until four for a seven o'clock game. Wow. Four o'clock for a seven o'clock game. And uh, was it that day you made your major league debut or was it the next one? That day. I, and the funny thing is, I did not know one person in that clubhouse. I, obviously, I knew some of them because they're the big leaguers and you see them around spring training and stuff like that. Shoot, I played video games with them probably two nights before. I drop my stuff off. Mark Grace comes and finds me and says, come on, kid. He said, we got to go meet the manager. And I go in there and meet Chip Hale talk to them. They go and introduce me to all the other coaches. And then Garvin Allison was the bullpen coach. He said, Hey, go throw some pants on, throw your BP top on. Let's go play catch. So I go out to the field there. The Rockies are hitting BP. I play catch for 15, 20 minutes, go in, shower up, eat right before the game. And off it was to the, to the bullpen. And then ninth inning rolls around 
Brad Ziegler had gotten in a little bit of trouble. They didn't want to keep the closer in after the tie game was blown. And first and third, one out, Grar Parr sitting to the plate, and right, here we go. Yep. And, and uh, you get uh, two outs with one pitch. Is that correct? One pitch, yep. And so I threw – Like the third pitch you threw, I think. I threw three sliders on the row. First one missed a little bit outside, landed the second one. So I guess he kind of saw it for that, and he saw it again. He said, here it comes, and he just went for it. And, and the funny thing was, I come into the game, and Nick Ahmed sitting there and says, hey, he said, get me a ground ball, I'll get it to Gene, and we'll get it to Paul, and we'll get out of here. Just saying it casual. And I was like, okay, let's, let's go. And it happened. And, I, and we, even though we were down, like I said, I pitched with a lot of motion. I got fired up and yelled and got very – I was really excited about that. <laughs> I bet you were, understandably so. Anybody would forgive you for that. Um, did your wife make it there in time? She did. She got there. And actually, funny part where Stryker was down there rehabbing. And I called Stryker that morning. I said, hey, listen, this is what's happening. I'm going to the big leagues. Can you pick up Chelsea? Because Stryker was my roommate the year before in, in uh, Kane County. So he picked her up from the airport. They drove to the field, and both of them were there whenever I debuted. Wow. And, and uh, over the course of, uh, of the next couple of weeks in your first big league stint, did any of your other family members get to see you? Oh, yeah. The, next, the funny part – not the funny part. The, it kind of stuck. My second family, people I've known my, since I moved to Tennessee, they raised me kind of, shaped me into who I am. I call them my second mom, second dad, my brothers. They were flying in, but their flight got delayed in Atlanta the night I debuted. So they watched it in the air from the airplane. And they, sh they came for the, the, day, the, neck, the final game against the Rockies before we flew out. So they came for the day after game. I didn't pitch, but they came for that one. And then our first road trip, we went to Miami, Colorado, and then Atlanta. No, we went to Atlanta, then Colorado. And Atlanta was Mother's Day. And... I probably, in a three-day span, put out or gave out like 150 tickets to family and friends because Atlanta to Nashville is about four hours. Right. So I, mean, I had high school, college, I mean, childhood friends that were driving down there to come watch. So I had a lot of people in there. I got to pitch on Mother's Day. And people don't realize it, a big, but when you're in the major leagues and you're giving away tickets, you have to pay tax. You have to claim those tickets on your taxes. You're basically buying all those tickets, aren't you? Yep, basically. And I think, I think Atlanta that year, because it was the last year of Turner Field, so they were a little more expensive. Even though there wasn't a ton of fans, it was the last year. So I think tickets ended up probably being 30 to $40 a piece. <laughs> and so I probably played for free those three games. But it was, it was well worth it because I, had, I just got to sit in the bullpen and understand the magnitude of what was going on. And, and then it – I mean, just kind of – that's when it started to dawn on me that this was – I mean, that I was there. My first game, I, I mean, it all went by so fast it was hard to grasp. Even in Miami, I was still trying to figure out my footing and how my routine was going to work. And then once we got to Atlanta, I kind of had not a grasp on everything, but I was getting a grasp on everything. And once I got to see my family and stuff, it really – when they would tell me how proud they were and this, that, and the other, that the hard work kind of started – it paid off. Yeah, yeah, it certainly did. And, and uh, 42 games in the big leagues over the span of three seasons, 2016 to 2018. And, and uh, you have always been so gracious with us, giving your time, coming back to our banquet, doing interviews like this. We're really appreciative. Uh, why, are you, why have you done this for, for an A-ball team that was uh, so long ago? Because Hillsborough is probably my favorite place I've ever played. It really is. I mean, from – the owners to the to KL to the to the clubhouse staff to you to just the on field workers, everyone is so welcoming, and I'll never forget that because coming in, I had no idea what to expect, and my career got off to the way it did and probably took off the way it did because of Hillsboro, and so I owe a lot of how I became and how I still am to y'all and y'all were so gracious to me and I think to every other play that's ever came through there that it's only the little bit I can do to give back to y'all. If I, if I lived in Hillsborough, I'd be there every day. I'd work, I, I would work, I would work there if I could. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Um, we, again, we're so appreciative. 
uh, you got released by the Texas Rangers last summer. Uh, weren't in spring training with anybody this year. I understand you're back home in Tennessee in your wife's hometown where you, uh, uh, you have a house um, that uh, I think, did you say you built it uh, the year you made your major league debut? Yep. So about probably the, towards the end of the 16th season after I debuted, we just decided to go ahead and take the step and uh, build a house. And we built our, our forever home out here and just made it to where our kids could grow up. And I kind of bounced around as a kid never having a true, true, like forever home. And I wanted to give my kids obviously more than I had. And so doing that then was the right thing at the time. And, um, and I, I couldn't be more happy about it. Yeah. And, and uh, I know you've told me that you, you hope to be able to pitch again, hope to see some more time in the major leagues, but at the same time, you're looking at other options and you're, you're back in school, you're getting a, getting a master's degree. You'll have your teaching t certificate soon and hoping to get a job there in the town where you live, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I am about 20 minutes, not 20 minutes, about 15 minutes from the high school out here. And so I'm definitely trying to uh, get on as a teacher there. I mean, teachers really can shape kids' lives. And I just want to help kids learn science. I love science. But also, teachers can be very influential. And I had some teachers that were very influential on my life. And I never thought I'd be want to be a teacher but I started substitute teaching this off season just to kind of get around it. And I loved it. I loved seeing the kids and kind of interacting with them. And at the high school level, it's a very impactful year, years for them. And uh, just to have someone they can talk to, to not mentor. I don't want to be, a, I'd love to mentor, but I don't want people to think that I want to be, give my time to kids and work with them. And then if I can be a baseball coach at the same time and do what I love and give what I've learned from every step of the way to these other young kids. I mean, it's the second best thing I can do besides playing in the major leagues. Yeah. Well, that, that, that really says a lot about you. And you mentioned you love science. I know you'd like to teach biology, but in your time as a substitute teacher, and you're not the type of person to advertise this, but how many of the students in those classrooms you walked into knew that, uh, Hey, just uh, last year, this guy pitched in the big leagues. I had a few guys that I'd worked with doing lessons during the off season, or I'd gone around the baseball team here at Loretto that knew me that were still there. And they might, they would mention it to kids. I would never, I never once said it to anybody. I didn't even tell the faculty what I did or where I'd come from. Um, but, and then some kids would ask, well, why are you here? You're, you're young. I said, well, I'm, I'm in between jobs. And they'd ask my name and like kids do nowadays and they're very good at it. They will find you on the internet very fast. So they just typed in my name, me not telling them what I did. And it pops up major league baseball player beside it. And then it just kind of wildfire from there. So now people ask all the time questions and stuff. And so. And of course you had the long hair when you were, when you yes. were pitching for us and pitching in the big leagues, had, had you cut it by the time you were, you were in the classroom? Nope. I, I, I wore a man bun every time I tried to look, professional so I never had it down down um I would wear it in a very professional I guess man bun you, you and, got the man bun now or you got the haircut oh no it's it's all gone now so <laughs> I got wild hair right now but no just probably about a month and a half ago I, I don't know I just had a wanted to cut it see what it looked like kind of do something different I mean it's hair it'll grow back um I always kind of told myself that my long hair was my superpowers. I was like Samson from the Bible. Right. If I, I lost my power. And then after last year having a bad season, I was like, well, can't have these superstitions like that. Let's just kind of switch it up and see what it looks like. It'll grow back if I don't like it. So I cut it about a month and a half ago. Well, Zach, I really appreciate your time. It's great reminiscing with you. And, and I would love to see you get another shot in baseball. Would love to see you back in the big leagues. And, uh, and if not, um, I think it's, it's a, it's a great thing for the students there in Tennessee and, and I uh, would love to see you teach. I appreciate that, Rich. I think, thank you all for everything. Okay. Thanks a lot and uh, good luck. Thanks guys. See y'all later.